So this is going to just serve as a reminder for us to go through the rest of our class, understanding what is it that I mean when I say hydraulic rate line, when I say flow, velocity, where are all these numbers coming from? Okay, um, so first of all, uh, we classify the flow in, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong key, in either open channel flow or pressure flow. Uh, open channel flow we refer to as any flow that has a free surface exposed to atmosphere. And the pressure flow is flow that's in closed pipes and it's going under pressure. And the hydraulics for both of those are slightly different, so we'll cover both in this presentation. Uh, for either of those flows, there are some basic properties and assumptions that we make for the software. Uh, first of all, we assume that the fluid is incompressible, that is turbulent, uh, and that it is a Newtonian fluid. Uh, sometimes people would say, well, in typical wastewater systems, uh, it's not just water flowing there, uh, but the amount of solids do not change the viscosity significantly. So we can very safely assume that uh, our wastewater flows are Newtonian fluids. In order to make the calculations, um, we use one or more of these principles. Um, the continuity of mass, the continuity of momentum and energy. So we're not magically generating uh, energy or water from anywhere. Uh, and that basically shows in these very simple equations um, that we can all understand. Um, so the conservation of mass or continuity require, means that if you, if you look at any node in your model, uh, whatever comes in as inflow has to equal what comes out as outflow. Um, and if that's the case, that means that there is no storage. So very simply explained here. Um, we also would have the situation, for example, at a manhole where we have flow coming in from the upstream manhole, uh, and then we have additional flows coming in there. So we're bas it's just the A plus B has to equal C, right? So anything, everything that comes in has to be uh, equal as to what comes out. Uh, if there's a difference, it's because it is being stored at that uh, particular manhole. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, conservation of energy uh, means that, that you don't just magically generate energy. Um, and we also know that energy, uh, that the water is going to flow from a place of high energy to a place of lower energy. Uh, that typically trans translates to, uh, if it's gravity flows, it goes from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. Uh, when we talk about energy, we use two, uh, very often we use these two terms, uh, energy great line or hydraulic great line. Uh, I'm gonna show you what they mean here in this graph makes it a little bit easier. So energy great line is the sum of the pressure column. So if we're talking about a pressurized pipe flow. So look what we have here is a pipe and we have flow um, pressurized. So you can see that the water level would be equivalent to uh, this elevation. Uh, so at this particular point, we could say the energy grade line equals the pressure head plus the elevation and the velocity head, which is this portion right here. So V squared divided by 2G, right? So at any point, uh, we make the same assumptions. So if we look at this uh, point number two, we see the same components, right? So elevation, pressure, and the velocity head gives us that energy great line component. Um, and we see that the difference between point one and point two, well, we see that there is a reduction in energy. And the 
mathematical explanation for that is that there are some losses. So some energy is lost uh, when we move from Z1 to, from point one to point two. And most of the time, or the largest portion of this head loss is due to friction in the pipe. Okay, and so it takes energy to move from here to here because we're just kind of fighting against the friction on this pipe, uh, which is why it's important when you input your pipe properties to input the correct material uh, so that we, and, and you know, there are different methods for calculating those friction head losses. Uh, but most of the time that energy is lost due to friction. Um, there's also something called minor losses. So if you have, you know, like a, a change in diameter, so the pipe all of a sudden got smaller, or maybe there is a T or something like that. Those are minor losses. Uh, minor because in comparison to friction, they're very small. Uh, okay, so that is the energy grade line. Uh, you can see that below the non-dotted uh, line is the hydraulic grade line, uh, which is the same as the energy with the exception of the velocity um, head, right? So hydraulic grade line is based on the pressure head plus the elevation. Uh, very often, uh, if you have, for example, for the pressurized portion of your um, system, you have pressure readings. Um, if you want to convert them to hydraulic rate line, all you have to do is add the elevation of that point where you took that pressure reading, and now you have um, the hydraulic rate line measurement at that point. Okay, so. Uh, basically, what we're doing here is showing you how we compare the values from point one and point two. So we make the conservation of energy, uh, say energy in one has to be equal to the energy uh, in two plus any friction head losses, right? So there we see our three components. Okay, so that's for pressure. Um, what happens when we have open channel flow? Uh, where our flows really are not pressurized. Um, well, it's very simple. Uh, the pressure component is no longer P, um, as we saw it here, remember? We had the pressure of the fluid divided by the specific weight of the fluid. That's what I was calling the pressure head. Uh, so we basically changed this term. So we're going to change this term when we're dealing with open channel flow uh, to just be uh, y. And what is y? y is the depth of flow. So if we're going to uh, look at point 1 and point 2, we can see that the energy gradient is the depth of flow plus uh, the elevation of that point. Uh, plus the velocity head. So the velocity head component did not change. And then the hydraulic grade line is simply the depth of flow plus the elevation of that point. Okay, and if we look at that, when we are doing our conservation of energy, basically saying the energy in one has to be equal to the energy in two. And for that to be the case, um, there has to be some friction head losses um, as well to account for the energy loss between one and two. So really uh, the same equation. Okay, so how do we come up with this um, H sub F, so the head loss is due to friction? Well, there are different uh, equations for calculating that, that um, the energy that is the head losses, which is the energy used to overcome friction. Um, there are different equations. In the US, typically, we are looking at Manning's equation. Um, in Europe, this is uh, probably a more common uh, equation. Uh, as we mentioned, most head losses are due to wall friction because the minor losses, minor losses are small in comparison. Um, so I mentioned that in the US, the most commonly used equation is Manning's, uh, which is this equation you see here. 
Um, and for this, basically all we need to input is the roughness coefficient. Now, there's already a table that has been generated. This is a, an uh, empirical method. So, you know, in the lab, there were done several tests to come up with these n values. Um, everything else um, is dependent on the information that you've input for your pipes, such as um, the cross-sectional area of flow, um, hydraulic radius, um, slope of the energy line. So really all we need to input is this n. What does the n value depend on? Um, different factors, and you can read them all in here. Um, but really, we don't go out there and measure Manning's. You could, right? and if you were doing some calibration and you needed to get the Manning's coefficient correctly, you could do some experimentation. But for the most, I think 99% of the time, uh, what we'll end up using is just a table that looks like this. This actually came out of the software's, software's help menu. Uh, but you can Google it and find it anywhere or in any of the books. Um, other parts of the world use different equations like the cutter uh, Chesi or the Darcy Wasteback. Um, this is very popular, but the problem with this is that to come up with the friction factor, uh, it's not a value that you look up on a table. Um, actually, to determine the F value, you use uh, the Moody diagram that you can find here. Um, so you must know the Reynolds number. And then you come up here, for example, you figure out, oh, not very straight. <laughs> um, so once you know the Reynolds number, uh, you need to know the relative roughness, uh, which is one of these lines here. So let's say that um, we're going to use this relative roughness. And that relative roughness is a combination of diameter and pipe material type. Uh, and then with that information, you come here and read your F value. Um, the problem with this is that it's an iterative process because this F value is like a moving target, uh, right? Since some of these things depend on the velocity of your uh, flows, and we know those are not constant uh, values. Okay, so... If you were to use this, uh, you could use um, the relative roughness, which is found also in the software. Um, another problem with this uh, method or using this um, equation is when you end up doing, uh, it's not as straightforward when you do calibration because you can't really measure this on the field again because uh, our flow conditions are not uh, constant, right? Which um, makes the Manning's equation a little bit more uh, favorable for calibration purposes. Um, here's the Hazen-Williams equation. Typically, we use this for pressure systems. And in this case, again, you need to know the Hazen-Williams C factor. Again, this is um, experimentally obtained. And all the other values uh, are input values. Here are all the headless methods that are available, uh, depending on what solver you're using. So you can see that uh, when you use the GVF rational, you have uh, almost all those methods available. Okay, so we lose energy due to friction, but also to minor losses. Uh, things like manholes where you have entrance, entrance losses, exit losses, changes in flow direction. Um, so this is how we calculate those minor losses. We multiply a K value. So this is our minor loss coefficient. We multiply it times the velocity head. Um, the problem sometimes is that if you spend a lot of time um, putting your k values together, um, because you know they will change um, for every manhole, every pipe. Sometimes if your velocity is very small, like it often is, uh, 
in sewer systems, then the V square uh, turns out to be a zero point something. And when you multiply your uh, K value times zero point something, you know you're going to end up with a very small number. So that's why many people choose to not spend that much time um, inputting minor losses. But you want, if you want to, you can do that. Um, here are some of the minor loss methods available depending on the solver. Uh, again, if you use the GVF rational, you know all these methods are available. Uh, notice that all this information um, is typically where we do input this is at our manholes, right? When they're more uh, severe or more significant. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, other considerations that we have into account when we talk about um, open channel flow. Uh, we'll refer to the flows as steady or unsteady, uniform or non-uniform. Um, so steady or unsteady, we kind of talked about that already. Uh, steady means that the flow properties don't vary over time, so it's like our snapshot, our steady state simulations. Uh, unsteady is basically looking at how things change over time. And uniform or non-uniform flow um, depends or the, the classification is whether uh, the properties vary in space, uh, for example, along a channel. So most of the time we do have things, uh, flow properties changing in space. Uh, for example, when you have things like, um, where did they go? I have pictures of this here. Um, so you can have a weir, for example, you can have a change in slope and all those things would cause your uh, flow to be classified as non-uniform flow. And our solvers uh, obviously evaluate that kind of flow. Uh, so we know that most natural channels are non-prismatic. Uh, our sanitary sewers are considered non-prismatic because there are manholes uh, that change uh, the way that flow changes in space. The pipe diameters also change. They tend to increase, right, as the flow moves downstream. Uh, there's changes in slope and direction. And you can also um, have controls, like those weirs that you use actually um, to influence the water levels in your pipes or open channels. Okay, so here's a summary um, of the different types of flows, whether they're steady, unsteady, uniform, or non-uniform. Okay, uh, how does the software compute, right? Uh, what are the solution methods used? Well, we are breaking it down here in two different um, areas. So if you're using a gradu gradually varied flow solver, uh, or if you're using a dynamic solver. So if you're using the GVF solver, again, which is the sewer cat and focus on of this class, uh, for the gravity subnetworks, we first comp compute the flows. And to compute the flows, we go from upstream to downstream. So as we move downstream, we are adding flows typically, right? Um, and then when we get to the end, we use those calculated flows to now compute the hydraulic grade line uh, from downstream back upstream. Okay, so our hydraulic grade lines, uh, if, you think, if you think of things like um, surcharges and things like that, um, and we'll see some examples of that uh, in our profiles, and just keep in mind that we first calculate the flows upstream to downstream, and then we go back from downstream to upstream to calculate uh, the profiles and the hydraulic grade lines. And the pressure subnetworks uh, use the modified EPA net based solver, again, the same used in WaterCAD and WaterGEMS. And the dynamic solvers, um, they use the full same Venn equations for 1D flow in open channels. Um, and 
depending on whether you use the implicit or the explicit, uh, the numerical method is slightly different, but they're both using the false name and equations. Um, okay, other concepts that um, we use when we're talking about our flows, uh, we talk about specific energy. And specific energy is a total energy at a point uh, with respect to the channel bed. So again, it's the depth of flow times the velocity head. And why do we need that? Um, well, basically because we always think of our flows as are they supercritical or subcritical. Um, a supercritical flow is um, typically what you would think of a shallow but fast moving um, high velocity flow, whereas um, a subcritical flow is kind of a more a higher depth but slower moving flows. Um, and we separate those by the critical depth, right? So anything um, above the critical depth is supercritical flow, below the critical depth is the subcritical flow. Um, so here's an example of the cross section, what, what it would look like. So if it's supercritical, it has a fruit number greater than one, and the flow would look something like this, shallow but fast moving. Subcritical is um, higher depth but slowing moving. And sometimes we're concerned with this uh, for many reasons, but often when we have a transition between this, we can have things like hydraulic jumps. Um, so that's a high concern. And what the software uses to classify um, that critical, uh, subcritical or supercritical is we use the fruit number, which is reported um, automatically for all your elements. Um, sometimes you might wish to know what's a flow profile classification. Um, you actually see this when you look at the profile of your pipes. Uh, we'll do that many, many times in this class. Um, but here's a chart that shows us the different types of flow profiles that we can have. Um, so basically mild slope, critical slope, steep slope, um, adverse slope, um, etc. If you would like to actually get this reported for each of your pipes, um, you can do that in our tabular reports. All right, and we talked about non-uniform flows and how you can have different controls. Um, here's a picture of one of them, a weir. Um, but you can have other things like free outfalls, uh, flumes, and they can all be input uh, as well in the product. All right, uh, I mentioned at the very, very beginning today that different countries uh, would have different um, regulations, right? So they say uh, to ensure that your pipes are self-cleansing for sewer systems, you have to have at least a velocity of this. Or other places would say, uh, no, we don't care about the velocity. We want to make sure that you have at least a tractive stress of certain value. Uh, so if you're using the GVF convex, uh, we calculate the tractive stress for you, and this is how it's calculated. It um, depends on the density of the fluid, the hydraulic radius, and the slope of the energy grade line. So what do we use this is we compare against that target value and see if our pipes are meeting or not that criteria. All right, <clears throat> so here's a brief summary of what we just went through. And so far we've talked about everything, all the equations that we use when water flows downhill. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you and see you next time.